uh, looks like everything's ready to go. Please welcome Adam Creek, uh, Radical Self-Interest. That was a, a great interlude, great interlude. Thank you very much. So, <clears throat> do you ever feel like uh, the world is a little bit too selfish? Uh, that people think a little bit too much about themselves and not really enough about the common good? Uh, I, I've been thinking about that a lot recently. And uh, I, I just wanted to share this idea with you and, and maybe discuss it with you. And, and some might say, well, that's capitalism. You know, that's a result of our, our Western sense of individualism. It just kind of, it, it comes that way, and we, we have to take the good with the bad. But, but what I believe is, is there's a way to reframe selfishness, coming from my own experience, that, that, that we can find something positive in it, and we can reframe selfishness to, to create a better society, to create a better community, something that, that you, as an individual, can really appreciate, right? And it's, it's all about the I, and so please uh, forgive my bad pun of the I, and uh, you know, true Canadian, I'm gonna apologize for my puns and be polite. But, uh, and, uh, and speaking to the first person who presented, I'm not really creating any new art, I'm just trying to use it in a way to relate to, to you guys. So uh, <clears throat> I think there's, uh, there's one thing I know. I, I know that the Olympics or we're based on our, our Western train of thought, or our Western train of thought in the Olympics kind of evolved from the same you know, local area in town. And, and myself, I competed at the Olympics, and I won the Olympics in eight-man rowing. And one thing I do know about winning the Olympics, you have to be really, really selfish to win the Olympics. And I also know a lot of Olympic champions, probably more um, Olympic champions than you have family at your extended family reunions. And, you know, when we get together, it's... The food isn't really that great, but you should see the games we play. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> but uh, but uh, to be honest, it, all the Olympic champions I know, they're also really selfish. And you can see some Olympic champions, their selfishness sucks your energy. It's, they're like energy vampires, and you get near them, and their ego overtakes you, and you think, why are you here? I don't like you. And then there's other Olympians who are they're very selfish, but you, you get by them, and you think... I want to have more of you. I, I, I love you. I love your energy. And I love what you're giving to me. So th there's this paradox that was existing. So I think that selfish energy can, uh, can be very powerful, but it can also be very dangerous. So I'll touch on the, the danger to, uh, of it first, and, uh, or one of the dangers anyways. I don't have time to go, to, to go completely into the subject. But, and then I'll go into uh, uh, the reframing and... Uh, I reframe selfishness in, in uh, the term radical self-interest, and uh, and hopefully we can embrace a sense of radical self-interest and, and you know and take this innate individualistic uh, energy that we each have and use it for for the common good. So, <laughs> self self achievement of of large goals can often lead to what I call gold medal syndrome. People will go and they'll. You'll win an Olympic gold medal, right? Or you'll, you'll complete a PhD, or you'll get your dream job, you'll build your, your dream house, and you're depressed, right? You're, you're sad. And, and what is that? And, it's, and I, I see that time and time again, especially when, when someone achieves something from a, a strong ego-based mentality and of our ego-based selfishness, and, and I see it, and that's, those are the people I've interacted with, those are the Olympic champions I've uh, interacted with who suck me dry, who make me not want to be around them, make me not want to aspire to be like them, and it's, it, that is, that's a form of selfishness that, you know, they were able to find selfishness, and they were able to embrace it, and they are able to be successful, but you can tell that there's a deeper pain that exists within them, and, uh, and it's a, it's a problem that exists throughout our society, and it's, but it's, it's something I think that, is a, that, that we can work with, right? And we've all, we've all known someone, I, I think, that you think they have everything that they should ever want, but they're not very happy, right? They, they haven't really found that, that fire, that, that, that passion, that, that's something that, that drags them forward. And I believe that we can, we can pair, we can find this royal pair, right, of, of success and fulfillment. They can both exist together. And I guess let me, let me go back. I, I have experienced this, this feeling of, of gold medal experience myself. After, after I first won the world championships, it was, it was pretty cool to think, wow, I'm best in the world at something. This is pretty cool. But then I, I found that I was depressed 
shortly afterwards. And I saw the same when the Americans beat us, and I row in the, I'm, I'm a rower, and the eight-man rowing boat, just so you know. And uh, when the Americans beat us in 2004, we went to the Olympics, I saw some of the Americans a couple months after, and they were depressed. And then I saw it in my teammates after we won the Olympics in 2008. Some of my teammates after winning the Olympics were depressed. You know, it's you know, the pain of victory. You don't really, it's not really discussed that often, but it, it's certainly out there. And so it's, it's about joy, right? It's about happiness, and it's about pursuit of happiness. I'm finding something that is, that is really engaging and, and, and enjoyable. So how, how, do we, how do we merge success and happiness? How do we encourage this, this, this selfish nature, right? To, to be successful, you must be selfish. And I'm a firm believer in that, and I don't think... I, it would take a lot of discussion to sway me from that. But uh, it's, it, I think of the, the Dalai Lama, and he had this great interpretation of selfishness. I went and I saw him speak when I was down in California, went to school to, at Stanford. And he, he was speaking uh, just outside uh, San Francisco, and he gets up on the stage and gives this fantastic discussion. He's sitting there, he's very present. And then at the very end, he says, you know what? I'm a very selfish person. I love my sleep. And it's close to my bedtime. <laughs> Goodbye. And with that, he walks off the stage and he's gone. And, I, and that resonated with me because I thought, well, he's very selfish, but he's a very happy and a very fulfilled person. So there's, there is something good, right? But, you know, he comes from the Eastern train of thought. And so there's, there's a form of selfishness that we, that we could embrace in our Western individualism. So I think the easiest way to define something is define it by what it is not. Right? Radical self-interest, and I, I wrote down some of these things, uh, radical self-interest is not greed. It's not hoarding excess wealth. Right? Radical self-interest is not the pursuit of instant gratification. Right? Radical self-interest actually encourages delayed gratification. Radical self-interest is not the pursuit of fame, nor does it lead to the tragedy of the commons. And if we go to the other end of the spectrum, radical self-interest is not really altruism either. It's not, it's not a, coming from a, a pure place of just giving. Uh, but radical self-interest really is caring so much about you and your immediate family that you give wholeheartedly to your environment and to your community, right? You want clean air to breathe. You, know? you want clean, clean water to drink and to swim in. You want clean food to eat, to nourish yourself, to nourish the family, nourish your children. And so you support, you support measures that create that. You support you know, organic farming, you support water conservation, you, you support uh, cleaning up the world around you. Or you support your community because you want someone to support you to achieve your ambitions. Because you're not going to achieve anything on your own. No man's an island, that's uh, you know, it's an old, or no person's an island. And uh, <clears throat> that, it's an old saying, we, we need one another to, to grow up and to, uh, and to get what we want. And I thought I'd bring, bring some stories into this. And uh, I, I'm on the board of directors now of the Canadian Olympic Committee, and we, were, we had a, a session meeting in Montreal a while ago, and the CEO of Bell was there, and I was talking to, the, to him about his, his donation. You know, their company <coughs> donated $200 million to the Olympic Games to make it happen. And what he was doing was he was donating to a values-based sporting event. Right? The Olympics is based on values. You know, there's, there's issues with the Olympics as there are with, with any large organization, but it's, it's, it's based on values, on... on uh, on perpetrating values throughout a society that are positive, that are collective, that are bringing people together. And uh, I asked him, well, why, why, why this generosity? Why did you guys decide to do it? And he said, well, I, I'm just a sports fan, and those values of the Olympics really aligned with the values that I wanted to create in my organization. And there's this funny payback effect, right? When is George Krupp is his name. And uh, there's this funny you know, feedback effect. All of a sudden, the culture of our organization which was old, it was stodgy, it was relying upon a monopoly. Uh, it became new, it became vibrant, it became innovative. And changing this, the culture, changing the attitude of people is really priceless. Right? You're, you're speaking to something that you can't put on a balance sheet for $200 million. And he said, well, and on top of that, <laughs> you know, profits raised 61% after our involvement in the Olympics. So that was pretty good too. And if you, if you think about it, there's nothing really more selfish than a corporation. Corporations are set up just to be selfish, self-serving. But if corporations start embracing the whole idea of radical self-interest, not only are they going to create more fulfillment and joy within the employees of their organizations, but these, these uh, corporations will also 
be more successful. They'll, exa they'll exist for the long term. They'll be, you know, a 3,000 year organization, right? They won't be one of those organizations that comes for 50 years and dies. And that's, I think that the top leaders in the top organizations around the world are thinking that way. How do I make a 100 year, 200 year, 1,000 year organization? And uh, I think of the Dockside Green development that I live in, right? I live in the Dockside Green over uh, in, in Vic West. And sure, it's great environmentally, but on the other side of things, it's, you know, it scribes, and it won this, this an award. We got the LEED Platinum Certification. It's the best, uh, it got 63 out of 70, the highest uh, LEED, which is Leadership in Environmental and Energy, energy Design, highest uh, designation in the world. And it's, it's great. It's, it's great for, for the community. But on top of that, I have low VOC paint. There's, a, there's an uber healthy HVAC system where I get super clean air. You know, I've got a low commute time. I can walk to work. I've, I'm, I'm in this community that is, that is vibrant and there's, there's interesting people around. So those are all very selfish things. And that was, that was the turning point for me because it, was, it actually made my life better by doing something that was better for, for the community. And... Uh, this, this next December, I'm planning to row across the Atlantic Ocean. I'm rowing from Liberia to Venezuela. And I'm teaming up with, uh, with three other guys. Uh, they're from, uh, they're from C Seattle. And when we're doing this trip, we're also embracing the idea of radical self-interest. Because initially, I'm, I was called to this. You know, not because... Yeah, I, was, I was called to this because I want to know what it's like to be in the middle of the ocean away from everybody, and I'm envisioning this, this point in time when the, it's completely calm. You know, the moon is out there, the stars are brighter than I've ever seen, and as the oars are dipping in the water, the phosphorescence are glowing, and it's an incredible contrast to the storms that I'd experienced, you know, a couple days before. But that in itself is a very selfish desire, right? Just to have, you know, a transcendent experience. You know, it's really good, but it's very selfish. And so we started thinking, how can we make this a larger impact? And how can we bring in more players so that this actually becomes something that's interesting for the community? And we partnered with Right to Play, which is an organization I believe in deeply. It uses sport and play to positively impact uh, youth. Uh, it, it, it uses play to educate, uh, lift kids out of poverty, disease, war. We partnered with Harvard University and, and University of Calgary to study the physiology. You know, what does rowing uh, two hours on, two hours off, 24 hours a day across an ocean for two months straight due to the human body. Well, there'll be some interesting research that comes out, so hopefully more people can, they can benefit from that. We partnered with an educator who can use the, you know, the spirit of human adventure, uh, adventure to create curriculum. And so we'll have curriculum in, in schools around the Pacific Northwest. And we'll have call-ins, we'll, we'll talk to kids, and we'll, we'll, we'll capture their imaginations, get them interested in technology, get them interested in... In, uh, in history and geography and, and, and world, world issues, right? And make them see that the world is larger and connect communities across boundaries. And that's the way that, you know, that's, that's the idea of, of radical self-interest. And uh, as, as I wrap it up, I'd, I don't just like to, to go to your recent examples to, to explain my ideas. Sometimes I like to go to something that's a little bit more timeless. And we all know the, the yin and yang. We've got the, you know, the black and the white, the day and the night. Uh, they're, they're all constantly fighting and they're interchanging. And we, we often look at the boundary, right? And we, all, we often look at the boundary line right there. But, uh, but sometimes we just don't, we don't look at that, that little white dot in the center. And right, if you, if, and if you look at selfishness as the black side of, of the yin and yang, and you look at that little white dot, every once in a while, the, the, the white dot will continue to grow. And not only are you b battling on the boundaries, but something from the inside will come up and overtake. And something will overtake. And, and that selfishness that we've been embracing from our, from our, our Western point of view will, will be taken over by this, this idea of radical self-interest. And there's... Uh, <clears throat> There's a guy out there, Herod Thurman, and, uh, and he was a mentor for, for Martin Luther King. And he had this great, uh, great piece of advice that he gave Martin Luther King. And, it, it, and to a certain extent, it's, it speaks to this idea of radical self-interest. And he says, don't ask yourself what the world needs. Ask yourself what makes you come alive. Because what the world needs are more people who've come alive.
And so I'll leave you with this. Just think of something selfish you can do and do it. And do it with the community and the greater purpose in mind. And I think you'll find it. And you'll think you'll find an incredible power within you. Thank you.